Welcome to the Future Thinkers Podcast. I'm Mike Gilliland. And I'm Yuvia Ivanova. And this podcast is all about the future. Hey guys, this is Future Thinkers Podcast, episode number 16. And today we're interviewing Vitalik Buterin. Vitalik is the core developer and visionary behind Ethereum, which is a decentralized open source platform uh, on top of which you can build different decentralized applications or dApps for short. It's based on a similar technology as Bitcoin, except you can build things on top of it. So if Bitcoin is like email, then Ethereum is more like the internet. Very interesting talk, quite technical at times, but I hope you guys keep up. In relation to the last two episodes we've done, it's sort of the practical way of having a decentralized voting system, monetary system, and who knows what else in the future. So pretty cool episode. Hope you enjoy it. Hey, Vitalik, thanks for coming on our show. Why don't you start by telling us a bit about yourself? You know, I basically don't really have a history of my own before I first sort of joined the scene when I discovered Bitcoin back in 2011. So I was still in high school at the time, and at some point I was browsing the internet. And uh, well, actually, the first time my dad told me about Bitcoin at some point early in March 2011, I thought, okay, it's a currency, it has uh, no intrinsic value, there's no way it's ever going to take off. And a, a, a few weeks later, I heard about it again, and I realized, you know, hey, if, you, if I hear about something from two completely different sources, it's at least worth investigating. And so I did. I started browsing the Bitcoin forums, uh, came upon a guy who was paying people $5 an article to write articles for his Bitcoin blog, and I started... Uh, doing that. I sent him a message saying, hey, I'd like to write an article for you on microtransactions. I did. And a week later, he sent me 5 BTC, which back then was $3.75. Yeah, a good wage for three hours work, you know. <laughs> and uh, continued for a while. Eventually, he ran out of money. And so I invented this kind of cool business model by which that particular Bitcoin blog would stay, would, uh, stay running. So the way it would work is that I would write two articles a week. We would uh, release only the first art paragraph of each one, and we would say, okay, these articles are for ransom. We are only releasing them if people crowdfund 2.5 BTC into this Bitcoin address. And that actually kind of worked. So that was kind of uh, my first interaction, both with uh, that particular decentralized currency and with the general idea that these kinds of platforms are cool for doing this kind of really rapid, I guess, social and economic innovation. And I was in university studying computer science full-time. Then uh, at some point I realized that I was uh, doing cryptocurrency-related things for basically over 30 hours a week, and so I dropped out, went into doing that full-time. Spent about six months traveling around the world, talking and visiting various different... Back then were Bitcoin communities, because back then it was still very predominantly Bitcoin, and there wasn't the sort of consciousness that crypto is and, and blockchains are an interesting thing in, in and of themselves. Spent uh, two months in this uh, weird abandoned factory in Spain, traveled around Europe, visited Israel. Eventually came upon a group of people that were actually trying to use blockchain technology for a yeah, much more broad set of applications. So they were looking at things like escrows, very specific kinds of financial contracts. So there was this protocol called MasterCoin, which was uh, trying to do a lot of those things. And I actually briefly kind of joined the MasterCoin team as a sort of informal consultant, came up with uh, two new features for the protocol. And eventually what I realized was that it really doesn't make sense for us for the protocol to be coming up with these features because people are just going to keep on coming up with new use cases every month. And it would be simpler to just have a programming language so people can basically write whatever features they want. So that was kind of the core idea behind Ethereum. At one point when I was in San Francisco, I kind of, like the thought came to me, I took a long three-hour walk, formalized a lot of what were the basic concepts back then, wrote a white paper, emailed it to a bunch of people, some people came back saying, hey, this is a really cool idea, I'd like to join, and you know, maybe help out in the end, uh, start actually developing the software for this. And so the team kind of coalesced over a couple of months, and I've been basically doing that full-time ever since. Uh, can you tell our listeners in plain language what Ethereum does? So I've actually kind of been changing the explanation every few months, I guess, as uh, we've been 
changing the emphasis on what Ethereum is about. Originally, it was just meant to be a decentralized platform for financial contracts. But lately, I think we've been expanding and the thing that we're trying to be is something closer to... Actually, one of our communications uh, people, Vinay Gupta, describes it as being the world computer. So the idea is that there exists this magic computer in the cloud and uh, anyone can uh, send programs to it. Anyone can uh, run programs on it. And those programs can talk to each other. And particularly importantly, you can trust that this computer will run the programs in the exact way that you meant them to run or that you specified them to run rather. So very simple, sort of not, not even all that significant use case of this. Suppose that you want to be reminded of something in five years. So you would create a program, which after five years would be programmed to automatically release some kind of notification. Take this program, push it onto, onto the world computer, pay some kind of transaction fee, and it's guaranteed that five years later, it's actually going to send you the notification. And that's guaranteed to happen, and that's even going to happen if any particular entity shuts down, so it's not the case that, you know, if Google shuts down, then the, the whole thing is going to break. There is nothing that any particular entity can maliciously do to, to try to corrupt the execution in some fashion. It's uh, also completely transparent. Everyone can see everything that's going on in the system. Uh, just specific kind of, kinds of use cases for something like this. Currency is just a simple one because, you know, it was the original blockchain use case. So what is a currency? Basically, it's just a program that maintains a balance sheet, right? And the balance sheet might say something like, I have $100 and you have $50. If I want to send $20 to you, then I send a transaction and the program interprets the transaction and and it switches my balance to 80 and yours to 70. Now, if instead I try sending $300, then of course the program is going to reply, nope, you don't have enough money, fail. So you can take this, this kind of program, you can upload it to the world computer, and everyone who sees the program can be guaranteed that the program will continue working in some particular way. It's kind of like a sort of very general and abstract kind of metaphor or wrapper for a very large number of categories for decentralization. So do you want to explain why decentralization is really important? Because obviously a lot of people talk about it, but what are the actual benefits of decentralization versus a centralized system? Sure. Yeah, I, I think it's a very important question because uh, now that we all of a sudden have the opportunity to decentralize a whole bunch of things, you know, with blockchains, you could decentralize the running of any kind of application. There is a bunch of other technologies that like torrent networks that do the same for file sharing. And, you know, people have been getting excited about things like the sharing economy, which is, you know, hey, you know, anyone can kind of be their own taxi company or be their own hotel in their spare time almost. First of all, there's two kinds of decentralization that people need to think about. The first kind is what I call architectural decentralization, which basically means that the whole system isn't technologically reliant on any single component, and the way that the system runs is actually shared among a whole bunch of different technological parts. And the second kind is political decentralization, which actually means that the system isn't just controlled by a whole bunch of different pieces, but those pieces are actually under the administration, under the own sort of local rule of a whole bunch of different people. So architectural decentralization without political decentralization so one example is torrent networks. So for example, you know, the original torrent networks, like things like BitTorrent and Kazai, they've been around since about 2003. They're really good for sharing files. Now, things like BitTorrent and Kazai, they're both architecturally decentralized because the, you know, the files are spread among a whole bunch of computers. And this makes the network extremely robust. It actually makes it more efficient. And it's also politically decentralized because there's no single thing that you can, that you can attack in order to shut it down. The interesting thing is that torrent networks as a technology, it turns out that they're just so efficient for certain use cases that they're sometimes even used in a completely centralized context. So as one example, you know, there's a whole bunch of online games like World of Warcraft, for example, where World of Warcraft periodically needs to send patches, which are just basically big software updates to all of its users. Each patch might contain several gigabytes because there's often a whole bunch of new content. And the question is, you know, how do these patches get distributed? One option is, well, everyone just downloads it from Blizzard servers. 
Problem is, that would be really expensive for Blizzard. So what Blizzard does is it uses a Tor network. Now, of course, it's completely centralized. Blizzard decides what, the, what content gets distributed from a political standpoint. From an architectural standpoint, every single peer, every single computer in the system is helping in both the downloading and the uploading. And that actually means that you're taking advantage of all of the network's resources. That actually allows the whole thing to happen much more efficiently. So blockchains are basically politically decentralized and architecturally decentralized. But I guess the important difference is that unlike Tor networks, blockchains don't become more efficient by decentralizing them, right? So you can't actually get a higher transaction throughput, at least right now. The sort of big difference here is all of the other advantages of decentralizing, things like reliability and things like transparency and what I call these political benefits that there's no one particular group that you sort of need, need to rely on for the whole thing to continue to work. Those are the ones that take center stage. I think this is really cool that it kind of takes the middlemen out of a lot of different types of transactions and interactions. But I'm curious as to how it could benefit certain types of middlemen that actually need to be there that make the system better. And I, I can't exactly think of many examples. Maybe you can. But can you think of examples where the middleman is actually important and, and how they could it could benefit them? Practical example, Uber. So it's one of those social network services. Um, now, the difference between Uber and taxi companies is that with Uber, anyone can be a driver. Anyone can be, can be a consumer. So it's highly open on both sides, right? Now, the middleman still exists. And, you know, to some extent, the, min the middleman is a bit of a greedy monopolist that's taking, that's taking far too large a fee for its own good. But uh, to, to some extent, also, it's providing a very legitimate service. In this case, the specific service is basically that it's being a reputation system. It's providing a sort of filtering service where it makes sure that customers are only interacting with drivers that are reliable, that have good ratings, that are not likely to be criminals and so forth. And, you know, that's a service that people need. So, you know, you can design a decentralized version of Uber, right? You, there's uh, at least one project called Wazoo's that tries to do that. The thing is that in that kind of a system, you, you still need to have a way of actually performing that kind of middleman functionality, right? You still need to have some kind of reputation mechanism or some, some kind of quality assurance or filtering or whatever you want to call it in order to bias the system toward customers being able to interact with good drivers. It's another more purely technical example if you uh, consider Skype. So originally, it was a fully peer-to-peer -peer system. And more recently, however, you know, I was soon after Microsoft acquired Skype, Microsoft moved to this architecture where they had a bunch of super nodes. And these super nodes are politically controlled by Microsoft. Architecturally, of course, they already are kind of decentralized and spread around the world. So, you know, depending on some degree what your political ideology is, there's two ways of looking at these super nodes. One way is that this is just Microsoft being corrupt and inserting, inserting themselves at the center in order to be able to spy on everyone's data more easily. Uh, the, and the other is that, well, as it turns out, extremely decentralized networks actually aren't all that, all that efficient because you, know, you need to send messages through a whole bunch of hops and having these really powerful hubs be involved in the process speeds things up. So if the second viewpoint turns out to be closer to correct, then in a good decentralized replacement for Skype, you still need to have some concept of super nodes. And so what really excites me about this uh, sort of field of uh, blockchain technology and what I've been starting to call crypto economics is the idea that what we're actually doing is we're combining a decentralized architecture with an economic system. And the advantage of an economic system is now, you know, originally 10 years ago, decentralization basically meant the only people participating in the system are amateurs. To some degree, th even things like Wikipedia, which you can think of as being partially decentralized, kind of have this sort of ethos behind them that, you know, amateurs, a really large collection of amateurs, the, win the wisdom of the crowds and so forth, can do almost everything that a slightly controlled small group of experts can. And sometimes that's more true, sometimes that's less true. So the, th the nice thing about crypto economics is that in some circumstances, you actually have the ability to use economic incentives. And, you know, people actually do have the ability to basically run some equivalent of a super node as a business. So 
inside of something like a decentralized Skype replacement. You could potentially architecturally set it up in such a way that anyone can sort of run one of these super nodes and they'd collect some very tiny micropayments in, ex in exchange for running it. And the system would, you know, architecturally, it would, look, it would look exactly the same way that Skype looks now. But from a political standpoint, it would ha still have the benefits of being completely open source, being a completely open, open standard and, and an open network and not having the risk that one particular company is going to end up sort of changing the protocol from, ever, from under everyone's nose after the fact at some point. Something like Uber, you know, it's... It's in some ways similar, you know, you recognize that this desire for some kind of filtering system is a legitimate thing. And you come up with ways of actually getting that information more efficiently from, I guess, decentralized sources. So the most common idea behind reputation systems is that if I trust person A and person A really trusts person B, then even though I might never have heard of person B, I still actually have some proxy evidence that person B is reliable. And there's been this entire field of reputation systems for about 10 years that tries to figure out how to most efficiently and unexploitably take advantage of that kind of data. Yeah, actually, in one of your other talks that I saw, uh, you talk about this having some sort of a like a, a blanket reputation system that could apply to different tools and different platforms within Ethereum. Like right now, for example, you have one reputation system that's your credit rating, another one that's your Uber rating, another one that's your Airbnb rating, another one that's your number of fo Twitter followers. So Exactly. And the problem, of course, is that if at some point you want to switch over to Uber from Uber to Lyft because, you know, Lyft might have lower fees or, what, or whatever else, then guess what? You lose your Uber reputation. These kinds of uh, really high switching costs are essentially one of the problems and actually kind of why I'm interested in this whole sort of very specific idea of trying to decouple reputation from everything else. Yeah, and I think also this platform-specific reputation like we have with current systems is actually helping those systems monopolize people's attention and their money because the cost of switching can sometimes be very high. So people stay with a system that's completely. increasingly inefficient or charges higher fees every year. Yeah, completely. So are you trying to create systems to transition people from these current monopolized systems into Ethereum? Or is that something you're just hoping that people will figure out on their own? It's uh, interesting that, you know, we ourselves as Ethereum.org can't do everything. But, you know, we are kind of involved as gardeners of parts of the system in a, in a very weak sense. Things like the core for the Ethereum protocol for MIST, that's something that we've been developing ourselves and that we're going and that we're going to continue to develop ourselves things that are built that are built on top so things like reputation systems uh, some of these different decentralized applications you know we we personally know a lot of the people that are that are building them a lot of them are a lot of them are building on ethereum a lot of them are kind of sitting back and trying to be as sort of generic and multi-platform as possible and until they see what what they should uh, throw more weight behind and uh, in some of the cases we've we've been supporting some specific efforts and you know in some cases we just as individuals working inside the Ethereum project are interested in these areas and we kind of help out on a lot of them. It's a multi-stage thing, I would say. So right now, the large part of our focus is on just building a platform and making sure that it's good and that it's easy to develop on. And once people see on top of this thing, you can actually build your own Kickstarter clone in 20 minutes, then that's when we see a lot more developer interest. Now, as far as transitioning goes, to some degree, we're facing the same network effect problem that just about everyone else is facing. There was a Facebook alternative called Diaspora that started appearing around 2010. And for a brief period of time, there were people who were posting stuff on it. And for a brief period of time, it kind of worked decently well, but then eventually it sort of fizzled. And part of the reason was that they just didn't have the ability to overcome the network effect. So there's multiple ways of dealing with that problem. One of the ways is that, you know, because we have Ethereum and we have this decentralized platform that's trying to, to some degree, facilitate everything at once, it stands a much stronger chance than any particular isolated effort of sort of having all these network effects reinforce each other and sort of take over at the same time. So that's one of the hopes that we're sort of putting our weight behind. In other cases, there's all of the same ideas that 
just about every other case of, of network effect busting involves, which basically involves making it easier for people to interoperate, making it easier for people to generally use multiple services at, this, at the same time, even providing some kind of transition paths. I would actually say that one of the benefits of decentralized technology generally is, is that, you know, when you actually start talking about how do you even move between one, de one decentralized platform and, and another, because, you know, eventually people are going to start building continually better and better and better ones. Then just because these platforms are so open, it's very easy to make sort of connections and links and links between them and, and transition people over fairly easily. Yeah, I think that's really cool that you guys are inviting um, a lot of developers to come and build projects. So it's not just one program that's running. It's a whole bunch of people doing all these different things, which kind of makes it more resilient to change and makes it, I think people are more likely to stick around if they can Im improve on things as they yep. get dated. Yeah, I agree. You know, one of the comments that I sometimes make about Ethereum is that if you look at Bitcoin, the Bitcoin wallet and the Bitcoin client, they're synonyms. They, they refer to the exact same thing. In Ethereum, the Ethereum wallet is just one of the many applications that runs inside of the Ethereum client. So the sort of vision here is something much more abstract. You know, we also have a lot of components other than just this world computer. So the sort of long-term vision is actually to build out something much closer to a full-scale decentralized application platform. And that would include things like the blockchain. It would include different kinds of decentralized data storage, decentralized messaging. And the idea is to present all of these in a sort of cohesive combined package that makes it really easy to work with all of them at the same time. I was looking up Ethereum the other day and found that you guys were, I think, the number three most funded crowdsourced campaign that has ever existed before. Can you tell me a bit about how you guys got your funding and how you posed it to the community? So actually, when we first finished that uh, that campaign, we were number two. Uh, I think the Pebble Watch just beat us out only last month. So what we basically did is that actually we didn't pioneer ourselves. It was originally a pro the MasterCoin, the project I'd been working on before. What they did was they said, OK, we are launching a new protocol. And inside of this new protocol, there is a currency. And they basically said, we are going to be issuing these initial master tokens by just selling them. You can buy 100 MasterCoin for a Bitcoin. And you know, people had the ability to do that. There was this sort of one month long sale during which they did. That's how the entire currency got issued. You know, unlike Bitcoin, which uh, issued everything to miners, MasterCoin actually lived on top of Bitcoin, so it didn't need any miners. You just had to distribute it somehow. So for them, it raised $500,000. And then because Bitcoin went up in value, it quickly grew to $5 million. It works really well for them. And we basically decided to apply the model to ourselves. Now, in our case, back then, we were, even still now, we're, we're using mining as a as a consensus algorithm the idea here is that you have a whole bunch of computers everywhere in the world that are solving very very hard useless but very hard mathematical problems and the point and the sole point of these problems is to deliberately make it computationally very hard to sort of add a block to the history of the of the system and so the idea is that there exists this sort of chain of blocks and each block represents the current state of the world computer and if you want to participate in updating it then you have the ability to just produce a block by spending a large amount of time computing so you know, it's the same model that bitcoin used um lately we've actually been thinking of moving away from that model to something which is uh, much more energy efficient but that's an upgrade that's probably going to happen in maybe at the end of this year so you know we had mining but even still we decided that Hey, it's a good idea to get to get money for this kind of project by selling the coins. We basically said anyone can buy ether at the rate of 2000 ether per bitcoin and there is no limit. We originally intended to start the sale in February 2014. We ran into a bunch of uh, of legal issues, you know, making sure it doesn't fall afoul of things like banking and securities laws. And it took us a while to do the legal work to manage to make sure that we're okay there. We were kind of thinking the sale would be in two weeks for a really long time. Eventually, it was actually in two weeks, and the sale started at some point in the middle of July. And people got the opportunity, they had the ability to go to our site, download a wallet, which is basically just a file containing the cryptographic key that you would use to, to later access your Ether. And you could 
purchase Ether into your wallet and and we would provide a Bitcoin address, you would send your Bitcoin to it and you, you'd get, you wouldn't get your Ether yet immediately because the Ether wouldn't exist, but you would get a sort of record in the blockchain and later we would run a script that would compile all the records in the blockchain to figure out how much Ether everyone has. So people piled in. In the first day, I think we got a few thousand Bitcoins and by the end of the first two weeks, we got up to a total of somewhere around $12.5 million. This back then actually made us the second largest crowdfunding campaign ever by a small margin. You know, eventually, it lasted, it lasted for another four weeks. Well, we received around $18 million because the Bitcoin price was falling at the time. We never really had anything more than about $15 million in our uh, Bitcoin accounts. So we had the money. We started you know, using it immediately to pay salaries, pay developers, massively expand the team and working on getting Ethereum 1.0 out the door as soon as we can. Very cool. Actually, one thing that you said got me uh, thinking of a question. With Bitcoin, the way that I, I understand, the transaction is near instant. So I wonder if with this system, is it possible to have a delayed transaction? And why I'm asking that is because is debt possible in this kind of system or is it intrinsically debt free? So you can definitely have a delayed transaction. And I guess one really nice use case of that is recurring payments. If you want to pay someone $10 a month, you know, in Bitcoin, the only way to do that is basically by using centralized services. You know, there's things like Coinbase that basically build recurring payments on top of Bitcoin. And the way they do that is you send your money to Coinbase and Coinbase just shuffles it on for you. In Ethereum, you could just write a script and your script would automatically send $10 every month. As far as debt goes, the problem with debt is that well, the system is fundamentally anonymous. Anyone can create an account, right? So if you were to create an account and your account had 1,000 Ether in it, and you were to make a delayed transaction that would send 1,000 Ether later on, then there's basically only two options. One option is that the 1,000 Ether is actually locked in that contract until, until you send it. And the other option is that you have the ability to take your Ether out during the meantime. But then if you do, then once it comes time to send the 1,000 Ether, then like, there wouldn't be enough Ether and it would fail. So you know, if you have a debt to someone, then unless you have some identity outside the system that you can use in order to sort of promise to repay, then fundamentally there's nothing to stop you from just running away and starting a new identity. So how would you deal with this kind of problem? There's a bunch of groups that are trying to do loans on the blockchain. So most of the time, they actually do involve things like, a lo like reputation systems. So trying to you know, use measurements that are... Y you can think of them as being kind of like decentralized credit scores and uh, use these measurements to figure out which uh, loan recipients are trustworthy and, which, and uh, which ones are likely to pay you back. On that note... I wanted to ask what other kinds of problems you envision happening in this sort of system, like fraud, for example, or companies trying to control large portions of the nodes. I don't fully uh, like understand it, but like the 51% problem. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, as far as the sort of bottom level consensus goes, the centralization issue is a huge issue. You know, people are very concerned that, you know, in Bitcoin, there's about five or six of what are called mining pools, which are basically like online entities that automatically produce blocks for you and basically tell you what block to mine. And you know, the reason why people subscribe to mining pools is in part because they provide more constant payouts. So you know, instead of getting a very, very tiny chance of getting a, a really huge 25 BTC reward, if you manage to mine a block, with, if you mine into a mining pool, then you just get a very constant stream of payouts. And there's like a few of them that control over half of the network. Uh, it's a risk, but it's a smaller risk because if those mining pools end up doing anything bad, then people can just switch to other ones. The larger risk is the fact that now that Bitcoin mining is basically controlled by specialized hardware, there are these devices called ASICs, uh, application-specific integrated circuits, that can mine in Bitcoin 10,000 times faster than any normal computer can. And so just about every miner that's that wants to be profitable is basically running one of these specialized devices. 
Problem is, there's an incentive for these ASICs to concentrate in data centers because if they're in data centers, then you only need to hire like a couple of full-time employees to manage all of them. And, uh, you know, those particular employees could become much more efficient at their job because they're, because they're doing it all day. So it's much more cost effective than just having a whole bunch of people run each one separately. And the pressure for the system to be very efficient only increases because the price of Bitcoin right now is dropping. And so a lot of miners are unprofitable. So, you know, right now, I think my estimate is that there's somewhere between 10 to 30 data centers that control over half of the network. And theoretically, the number, you know, the number could continue to decrease. So there's the data centers, then there's also the manufacturing companies. And I think the manufacturing companies are even more centralized because just the, sh the sheer amount of existing factory and infrastructure that you need in order to... Uh, actually build one of these ASICs just costs a huge amount of money. And there's a bunch of factories in China where a lot of the activity happens. So last year in May, I visited a factory, which at the time was producing a quarter of all the new Bitcoin miners that were coming into circulation at the time. So there's a couple of issues. One of the issues is that these companies might eventually decide to collude and start doing things like censoring transactions and even double spending. So double spending basically is this kind of attack where if you have more computing power than the rest of the world combined, then you can go back to some previous point in history and you can start mining. And eventually your history will have more computing weight behind it than the original history. And so people will basically switch to yours. And that way you have the ability to sort of go back in time, back to whatever point in time you want. One risk is, a, is that companies will just collude to do it. And one reason they might collude is to try to reverse their own transactions. So one option is that, you know, take $10 million, send the $10 million to a Bitcoin exchange, buy $10 million worth of Litecoin. Then you go back in time and you sort of cancel the transaction where you sent your $10 million. And now you have your $10 million worth of Bitcoin back and your $10 million worth of Litecoin. Second option is that you could short Bitcoin on an exchange. So there's exchanges that let you basically bet against the Bitcoin price. And if an attack succeeds, then you could basically earn a huge amount of profit from this. So there's those possibilities. The other possibilities are that just some guy hacks into a lot of these uh, farms at the same time. Third possibility is that theoretically, you know, the Chinese government might be able to just do a 51% attack by giving all the data centers within China a, a warrant and basically telling them, you know, hey, cooperate with us or else. So it's a lot less decentralized than it seems. And the bigger problem is that we can't really quantify even how decentralized it is because you know, mining is completely not transparent. It's very hard to try to even trace where all the miners are located, where they're coming from and so forth, which to some extent makes it harder to collude, but to another extent means that we just can't know how bad the problem is without extremely serious analysis. Do you see Ethereum having these sort of problems too, or are you taking measures to prevent that? Oh, we're taking a lot of measures. So one of the uh, our initial ideas is basically coming up with an algorithm which is much harder to make more efficient with specialized hardware. And the theory is that people would be running would be much more able to run the software on normal computers. Now it could end up being like high-powered gaming rigs, but at least you know there's hundreds of thousands of people that are around the world that have gaming rigs. So it's going to be much harder to collude. Now, the strategy that we've been moving to lately is this idea of proof of stake, which uh, basically means that instead of the consensus being who has the most computing power, it's sort of process where the people that hold the coins in, in, inside of the system collaborate on making the next block. So, you know, instead of using computing power as a proxy for what your vote is, you would just have the amounts of ether that you have be the thing that that decides how much you get to participate. Do you think that might encourage monopoly, though? Yeah, that's it's a common criticism. So I would say that if we compare it to Bitcoin back in 2010, it's an extremely legitimate point. If we compare it to Bitcoin in 2014, then the problem is that the current system encourages monopoly even more because, you know, there's this economic concept of economies of scale where in the current system, if you're 10 times richer than someone else, then first of all, you can produce 10 times more. But then on top of that, you have the ability to make more efficient capital investments. And so you might even be even more than 10 times more effective. Whereas in this system, it's fairly simple. If you're 10 times bigger, you do 10 times more. Against the backdrop of the sort of more hyper-specialized mining industry that we see right now, 
it's probably an improvement against Bitcoin as it was ideally mentioned to be it's not. But unfortunately, you know, we can't guarantee that that it's always going to be the sort of idyllic thing where everyone just contributes a bit on their own laptop. So let's um, backtrack a little bit. Talk about some of the everyday applications of this kind of system if it becomes ubiquitous. You guys did a Reddit AMA and there was one response that I particularly liked where you described uh, a guy from the time that he wakes up to the time that he gets to work, all the different things that happen within Ethereum. Do you remember that one? Yes, I do. So could you kind of explain it to our listeners? Mm. So the idea was that a guy wakes up and uh, whatever amount that he's supposed to pay for rent every day automatically gets deducted from his, uh, from his balance. Whatever amount from that that's supposed to go for property taxes is automatically deducted from the government. You could use the blockchain or it's a trace where the government tax money goes. You could even see exactly what, what programs it, it ends up supporting. Then get into a car. While you're in your car, first of all, you know, we have this sort of decentralized self-driving car Uber scenario where what just about every car company is doing is they're building cars and then they're just sort of releasing the cars into the wild. And each individual car would just be pretty much autonomously running around looking for people that are that, that need to get from point A to point B. And it's using some standard computer science search algorithms to try to figure out exactly you know, how that particular car can get the most revenue. And so person would go on to some kind of decentralized marketplace and he would say okay i'm willing to, i want to go from where i am right now to here's my work location and you know please post bids on how much it would cost to to send me over and a bunch of these autonomous cars would post bids and the guy would pick the lowest one and the car would start driving him over at that point you know you'd have the option of either taking a, a road that has heavy traffic on it but where there would be some kind of dynamically adjusted toll, so the road would be more expensive, or taking a road that nobody else is using right now, and that, would, and that would be cheaper. And eventually, the guy gets to work. You know, chances are he might end up working for even some kind of decentralized organization that would rate his contributions and pay him for his contributions automatically, and so forth. You know, the idea behind the vision is that, first of all, you know, with these different kinds of decentralized marketplaces, you have the ability to really reduce the barriers to entry to different kinds of industries. So, you know, right now, if I wanted to start a taxi company, I don't just have to start it up. I also, I also have to go around and market it and try to get it adopted. And I'll run into network effect issues because I'm only in one place and so forth. Whereas here, there's one platform and it's a completely decentralized platform and anyone can participate on, on and on either side. Theoretically, it would sort of interact with Things like roads, roads would be enabled in order to incentivize people to, to, for example, drive less during peak hours and, dri and drive more when no one else is driving in order to minimize traffic. You'd have a whole bunch of these different systems for just about every sort of aspect of work, city planning, architecture, and so forth. Once the guy gets to his company and starts working, now this is the other really interesting question is, to what degree can you actually sort of decentralize the way that entire companies are governed? Because ultimately what some of these uh, decentralized platforms do is they basically replace companies to some degree and they place they, they just completely swap out their functionality for the system where anyone can come in anyone can participate and trying to figure out to what extent you can do that and so the sort of line is that the, the existing kinds of automation that we've seen tends to be the kind that automates away the people at the edges people like factory workers different kinds of manual laborers and so forth and this is kind of a different kind of automation that maybe paves the way for automating away certain kinds of managers. In recent times, it seems like the focus for a lot of entrepreneurs is to create platforms and launch these platforms with the idea that they'll be the middleman or they'll create the system and then the people will participate, not unlike Uber. So if this kind of system is going to change it, where do you recommend entrepreneurs focus in the future if everyone's using this type of platform? First of all, I think that one of the answers will just, unfortunate, will just unfortunately have to be there is less need for that particular kind of labor. You know, the effort of trying to push a platform out, try really hard to market it and monopolize the industry and so forth. There's just going to be less need for entrepreneurs in this particular space, you know, just because all these decentralized blockchain technologies just make it so much easier to build platforms. And so, you know, on the one hand, the profit opportunities are going to be lower. 
but on the other hand, it's also going to be much easier. So it's this interesting dichotomy in that it, it kind of reduces both at the same time. The best analogy might even be to something like the internet, where, you know, to, to some degree, it just let a lot of people enjoy themselves without spending uh, that much money at all. And it probably end, uh, ended up killing a whole bunch of business opportunities. But on the other hand, it helps people save a lot of money. And particularly, it massively reduced barriers to entry for people to create new kinds of businesses. So in terms of the kinds of businesses that will c continue to exist, in the 20th century, the paradigm was, how do I provide a, really, a whole bunch of things for a really large mass of people? What I would describe as a transition phase, it seems as though it's switching to how do I provide a platform for a whole bunch of people to help each other? But, you know, to some degree it is that, but to some degree it is still centralized because, you know, platforms like Uber, they're still providing the interface, they're still providing particularly reputation systems and so forth. So I think the future opportunities are going to have to do pretty much entirely with various different kinds of data aggregation. You know, the thing is that all of the intermediaries that we have right now are basically informational to some degree. So... There might even be opportunities to earn a profit by somehow just being an entity that provides a whole bunch of data for specific people that, that they need. Also think that the move to this more di to this digital realm that, you know, doesn't even have to do specifically with decentralization itself. It's been happening for 20 years. And it's also creating all of these sort of different concepts of virtual property. So people sometimes think that Bitcoin is the first, uh, like, really pure digital asset. That's not really true. The first pure digital asset is domain names. You know, it's a kind of sort of completely emergent form of digital property that just somehow emerged out of nowhere. And as it turns out, you know, it's a um, multi-billion dollar industry. You know, advertising is the thing that the beginning of this particular century invented. So the challenge would be trying to figure out what exactly the next decade's equivalent of things like advertising and maybe some form of sort of virtual property that just somehow emerges out of this, partic this particular industry is going to be. You know, I'm not completely sure about exactly what, the, uh, what that's going to be. You know, if I was, I'd already have a, a, bil a billion dollars of venture capital investment, but right now I don't. I mean, to some degree, we'll probably just see a continued sort of shift in industries that, that'll end up looking more like the finance industry. So you know, if you look at the finance industry, generally, you know, financial firms, they don't really serve customers, so to speak, directly in a lot of cases. All they do is they buy things and they sell things. What they're doing in the process is they're, they kind of are being informational intermediaries to some degree. You know, they're trying to quickly analyze a whole bunch of data about the world. They're trying to, fi and they're trying to quickly figure out, okay, is this data going to lead to this particular thing being more expensive or this particular thing being cheaper? And, and if they find an opportunity, they seize on it. And it's this kind of service that they end up providing on this extremely abstract level without quite, you know, without really sort of interacting directly. So I could easily see other industries in, in the reputation space kind of uh, moving toward that kind of model. Altogether, it's hard to say. On the kind of opposite side of that spectrum, there's a, a dApp that I read about called CryptoSwords, mm -hmm. and it's uh, uh, built on Ethereum, that, and it would allow content creators to get paid for really great content and for sort of talent scouts or trend hunters to be able to get rewarded for discovering this great content early on. Right. It's an interesting project. Now, I'm personally kind of a bit skeptical of the whole hey, let's tip people for the content they provide thing, because in practice, there are platforms that let people do that, and the tips generally end up being on the order of five cents, right? So, now, first of all, first of all my one point that I was making is that the opportunity to make massive profits by being an intermediary or by being a company will go down, but there's still going to, you know, if you provide something valuable, there probably will be more opportunities to earn, to make money from it just as some kind of an individual. So, you know, while I think that the idea of, I'm going to create some great thing and people are just going to do, you know, donate enough thousand dollars to me every month in order to, in order to let me survive is a bit over optimistic. But we are going to see, I think, more instances of, you know, hey, can you do this particular thing for me and get some small amount of money off from that? 
and you know that's a trend that even exists outside of the whole de- outside of the decentralization industry. There's a whole bunch of companies are jumping on this on this whole idea of you know quickly pay someone some number of dollars to do some particular thing, like microservices. Exactly, microservices. So uh, the potential that decentralization has to expand opportunities for people who are performing microservices is specifically this idea that you know you can jump between platforms and you can carry a, your reputation across them. What do you think about the near zero cost economy? Do you think that a platform like Ethereum would be kind of conducive to that? Because if a lot of things are decentralized, if they're not really managed by people or managed by people to a very, very small degree, maybe just for troubleshooting, would that make a lot of different services cost yeah. close to zero? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think there's a bunch of things that will just continue going going down in price so i mean there's a lot of intermediaries that just end up charging 20 or 30 percent and if the concept of decentralization takes off and does well then those are probably going to also decline to near zero so anything that has to do with various kinds of of informational arbitrage will go down it's almost a matter of asking what kinds of things aren't going to be zero cost anymore and, you know, that's to some degree a hard question because you have to figure out what is something that is going to continue to be valuable and that can't be provided for free in some sense. There's a couple of ways to answer that question. And, you know, the first one is that I was mentioning that I think that a lot of these new digital platforms, you know, they reduce the extent to which people care about physical property, but they also increase the role of various new kinds of sort of digital property that they create. The idea of domain names selling for millions of dollars is just one of them. I think that in general, there just are things in human society that are zero sum. They are status competitions to some degree. And those are just things that are going to disappear. And if old ones disappear, then, you know, new ones are just going to keep popping up. You know, people seem to like competing for status on a whole, all just for its own sake in a whole bunch of different areas. So there's always going to be things that have a price. If you can figure out that kind of thing, then I guess there's an opportunity to be to to be selling it. But in terms of everything else, at least things that can be digitized are just going to get to become cheaper. I mean, the things that aren't going to go to zero quickly are basically things that can't be digitized. So you know, food. Okay. Food is going to be cheaper. Eventually, we'll figure out how to do this whole automated food thing and produce extremely high quality stuff at lower rates. But, you know, it's still not going to be zero. Healthcare, not going to be zero anytime soon. So it seems likely that, I guess, things that you would categorize as being essentials would also just remain non-zero for some period of time. And to some degree, the digital economy can't magically make them much, much, much better all by itself. There are gains, you can make it more efficient, but there's always limits. You know, those kinds of things will continue having a price. Now, information is, is, is the one thing that's it's much harder to have, to have a price and have, and have that price be defensible. Things that aren't informational in any way, they'll probably remain non-zero for some time, at least, in, at least until the whole concept of a post-scarcity economy hits and we have robots and so forth. But then who knows what's going to happen. So do you think this platform has the potential to create a vibrant artist economy? Possibly. So one point that I'll have to make is that, you know, once again, I'm, I'm a skeptic of the whole tipping concept, but that's, you know, it's a side point that I think people don't even realize the extent to which that's only one particular way that you can tip artists. So if I'm an artist, then I have a bunch of things I can do. First of all, you, know, you can make personalized art for some specific person or, and for some specific group. And the demand for that could very easily increase. And these kinds of platforms actually make it easier to do things like that. Th- that's one path. The other path that I'm kind of interested in is that, you know, going back to the whole status symbol concepts, you know, at least back in the physical world, you know, people seem to have an interest in buying things that kind of express their support for a particular artist. And that would be things like T-shirts, things like CDs, thing, even just going to see them at a concert and so forth. Now, the specific property that those kinds of things have is that they're very public, right? And you know, it's, it's not just something that you're just buying as a private donation. It's something that you're buying specifically to sort of express you know, the, the degree to which you're interested in a, in a particular artist to other people. So 
there's opportunities to do something in the sort of digital equivalent of that. So come up with some kind of badge that, you know, that would exist in the context of a whole bunch of digital platforms that would somehow get attached to your profile. And that could be used to sort of represent your support in a, in a digital realm. And maybe that'll end up being a source of income for artists. So like doing something like that would probably be a very significant sort of behavioral economics and psychological challenge, but it could easily be done. In closing, I just wanted to uh, offer one hilarious bit to our listeners and as this thing called In Theorem, and it's a parody of Ethereum. You've seen this, Vitaly, right? Yes, I have. <laughs> so are, are you worried about the Bob Chain becoming a, a major competitor for Ethereum? Bob Chain is never going to scale, but Bob Chain 2.0 seems a bit dangerous. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you guys need help, or how do you hope the community will help you guys to achieve what you're trying to do? Right now, I think there's a lot of people that have ideas and a lot of them are really cool ideas. There's uh, a lot of people that are interested in uh, d in developing. I, I think there also might be a lot of people that might be attracted by the whole concept, by the whole idea of developing in this kind of decentralized application style. And to some degree, it's just a matter of reaching out to them and you know trying to make sure that people actually find out about what we're doing and you know ideally start building something. Cool. I think that's probably a good place to wrap it up. That was a really cool episode. I hope you guys liked it. I encourage you to go and research Ethereum on your own to kind of uh, wrap your head around it if you're not yet familiar. We will add a bunch of links to relevant articles and Ethereum's website on uh, in our show notes, which are at futurethinkers.org slash episode 16. And uh, if you like this episode, please leave us a review. That really helps us out. If you want to tell your geeky friends about us, we'll greatly appreciate that as well. And uh, we'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>